Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Dauphine and I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today, Certified Genealogist, Melissa Johnson. Uh, Melissa is a professional genealogist, writer and editor. She has expertise in researching families with origins in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and England and works on forensic cases, dual citizenship matters, and lineage society applications. She is also proficient in using DNA test results to break through ancestral brick walls. Melissa serves on the board of the Genealogical Society of New Jersey and the International Society of British Genealogy and Family History. She is reviews editor of the Association of Professional Genealogists Quarterly and editor of the Genealogical Society of New Jersey newsletter. Her work has been published in the National Genealogical Society Quarterly, New York Genealogical Biographical Record, the National Geological Society Magazine, Association of Professional Genealogists Quarterly, and numerous other publications. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much for joining us today and going to be speaking about some of the more deeper dives into genetic genealogy, something that's extremely popular now and has really helped a lot of people um, find find new roots and um, new branches to their, to their lineages. So um, before we jump into Melissa's presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Melissa's presentation, but please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat features in the Zoom dashboard. Um, we do ask that if you have personal questions related to a personal DNA test or your personal ancestry or lineage, um, that you contact Melissa directly after the program as those might require some more information um, and can be quite lengthy. Uh, Melissa has provided me with a copy of the handout, which I will upload to the chat momentarily. Um, you should be able to download directly from the chat. If you do have any problems downloading it, don't worry. A copy of the handout will also be sent in the follow-up email, um, which will also include a link to this recording. If you do have time, we ask that you please complete the survey at the end of the webinar. We always appreciate any feedback that you have. And if you're looking for more information on genetic genealogy, um, the Library of Congress has a wonderful website at the web address on the screen that will kind of get you into the basics, as well as some of the more advanced things related to genetic genealogy. And the last thing that I have for you, I just a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you will see your audio settings. This is where you can check to see if you're using an external listening device like headset or earbuds, just to make sure that it's all connected properly. At any point during the presentation, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that, that'll alert me, and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve any problems that you are having. And lastly, as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the chat button or the Q&A buttons, and we'll be happy to address them at the end of Melissa's program. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Melissa now. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Andrew. So today we are going to talk a little bit more in depth about genetic genealogy and how it can be used to help solve genealogical problems. And one of the key elements to using DNA to solve genealogical problems is viewing DNA as just another genealogical source. So we wanna think about DNA test results as something similar to looking at a will or a deed or a birth or marriage record. It is a genealogical source. It can provide information that often is not available through traditional research. And the reason for that is because sometimes that paper trail just isn't there. And sometimes the paper trail lies, whereas DNA does not lie. So how can DNA help us with our research? Number one, we can confirm what we think we already know. We can confirm those ancestral pedigrees that we have been working on for 20, 30, 40 years sometimes. 
We also may have relationships that are either hypothesized or that we have a theory about, but that we're not 100% sure on, and we can either confirm or disprove those. Uh, in some cases, we may not have a theory about who that next generation is, who the parents of, say, our third great grandfather are, but DNA can sometimes provide us evidence to break through that problem or that brick wall. Um, DNA, of course, can also help identify unknown parentage, and that can be distant, like we just talked about, not knowing the next generation of your family, but it can also be more recent, say, not knowing an unknown biological parentage. If, say, for example, your grandmother was adopted or your grandfather uh, didn't know who his father was, <clears throat> and that can be more recent, like with yourself, with a parent, with a grandparent, or it can be farther back. And then DNA is also great just to connect with living cousins. These are people that may have known your grandparents or great grandparents and you know, seen them in a different light than you. So people that may have pictures or family Bibles. So we're gonna talk today mostly about autosomal DNA, but we will touch on Y chromosome DNA and mitochondrial DNA very briefly and talk about how it's used, but not necessarily dive into how it's used. So when we talk about Y DNA testing, we are discussing testing on the Y chromosome. So that Y chromosome is something that's passed down from father to son. Um, so Y chromosomes are only held by men. Um, and they are passed down in a way that changes very little from generation to generation. So what that means is when you are looking at a Y DNA match list, you're looking at people that could be a first cousin or a second cousin or an uncle, or you're looking at people who could be related so distantly that you would never be able to trace it through a paper trail. So those matches can be very close or very distantly related, and it's sometimes hard to figure out what those relationships are. Now, I say that Y-DNA is passed from generation to generation and it changes very little, but when there is a change, that can help distinguish a family group. So say, for example, three brothers. Those three brothers technically have all the same Y DNA that they got from their father. But if one of them has a mutation, that mutation will continue down that one brother's line. So if you can somewhat figure out where that mutation took place, that's a way that you can sort of, in some ways, tell, well, is my third great grandfather one brother or the other brother or the other brother? So those different changes in Markers, those small changes can help to identify family groups. When you look at a match list for Y DNA matches, this is something somewhat of what you will see. Um, this is a match list on family tree DNA, and you'll see genetic distance. So what that essentially means is how many times, how many, how many markers are different from what your test shows basically. So in this, I have no genetic distance. These are my brother's test results, of course, not mine, but there's nothing that shows a genetic distance of zero or one. So a genetic distance of two is not too far away. You could know who that person is. That means there's two parts of their DNA that are different from yours. And that could just be two mutations. Um, and when you get into detail about Y DNA a little bit more, some markers mutate more slowly and some markers mutate more quickly. And so if they're those changes are taking place on markers that mutate more quickly, it makes sense that maybe that is a little bit closer of a relationship. So there are some of these people at a genetic distance of three that I can document a shared common ancestor with. Um, there are some people here that I don't, I can't document a shared common ancestor with. It does not appear that we are um, closely related in any way. So generally what is considered a close match can be anything from zero to three. Um, you'll see a lot of different opinions about this, but there are some people that you may have a zero genetic distance with that you can't find a relationship on paper with that person. And then as you saw with my test results, I have someone who is a sixth cousin who has a genetic distance of two. So um, zero to three is generally what's looked at, but there's a lot, of, a lot of different opinions about that and a lot of things to consider as well. So for using Y-DNA, Y-DNA is best to help 
to provide clues about a male ancestor's identity. So something that you can say, oh, well, this person is definitely not my ancestor because the Y-DNA just doesn't match. Or this person is a candidate to be my ancestor, but the Y-DNA won't tell you exactly which person is your ancestor because it could be one of several brothers. It could be one of their cousins. It could be their father. It could be one of their sons. So it often is helpful alongside other genealogical research and other DNA test results. Um, what DNA, why DNA is not great for is for fishing for matches. So the Y DNA pools are generally very small, a lot smaller than those for autosomal DNA. So it's not great for just putting your test results out there and seeing what cousins you might know that pop up. Um, it probably won't happen that way. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is similar to Y DNA in many ways. Um, of course, the big difference is that mitochondrial DNA tests the mitochondria. So um, that is passed down from a mother to her children. Um, some way to think about it is through what's called the umbilical line. So it's passed down from a mother to all of her children, not just her female children. So males have mitochondrial DNA from their mothers, but it ends with them. They don't pass it on to their children. Those males, their children get their mitochondrial DNA from their mothers. So mitochondrial DNA also changes very little from generation to generation. So just like with Y DNA, matches can be very closely related or very distantly related, and it's difficult to tell. So you'll see that genetic distance again, and it could be a zero, a one, a two, a three, like you see here. Um, in this instance, none of these people have any ancestry that we can trace back on paper to having a common ancestor. Uh, most of these people are not even, you know, tracing at least through their paper trail to the same region of the world that my maternal line was from. Um, mitochondrial DNA, just like Y DNA, it can provide clues to which female was that female line ancestor. But again, it's not going to distinguish among women in the same family. So between two sisters or between a mother and daughter or between a niece and an aunt, because they will all have the same mitochondrial DNA. Of course, if you do not have the same mitochondrial DNA as say another person in history, as you trace down through their ancestry and tested a living person, then sometimes you can rule someone out, but ruling someone in is not always that easy. And just like Y DNA, mitochondrial DNA is also not great for that fishing, for throwing your DNA out there and seeing what you get. So we're gonna talk a lot today about autosomal DNA. Uh, autosomal DNA is something that we all get from our parents, both of our parents, and they got it from both of their parents who got it from both of their parents. So what that means is that we have autosomal DNA from a lot of our ancestors. So not just the maternal line, not just the male line. We have it from our mother's father's mother and our father's father's mother's father and all of those different kinds of ancestors. Uh, autosomal DNA, we have two copies of each of our 23 chromosomes, and we get one copy from each parent. And one of those pairs is what determines gender. So going back to your ninth grade biology, you either have an XX or an XY for that last pair of chromosomes. So when these DNA testing companies are matching you to other people um, and telling you that they're a DNA match and that you share this much DNA with them and they might be a second cousin, they are able to do that because they look at patterns in your DNA and patterns in everyone else's DNA and tell you where they match up. So you might have inherited a pattern from your maternal grandmother's father's side of the family. And a third cousin on that line may have also inherited that same pattern. And that can be attributed to that ancestor. And he got it from somewhere before that, but you both have that same pattern in your DNA. And that's what the testing company looks for. And it can tell you, yes, you're related because you have that same pattern. And you probably have several of those same patterns throughout your DNA. So the main DNA testing companies that we look to today, and there are a lot, but these are the main ones, uh, Ancestry, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and Living DNA. And they all have a lot of similar features. Some of them have some different features as well. 
So again, thinking about how to use DNA, think about the research problems that you have in your own family and think about how DNA might be able to help you focus on some of those. Um, but definitely when you are working with DNA, it's best to focus your work on a specific research question. So if you're trying to figure out if the candidates you have for your second great grandfather's parents are potentially you know, related to you, can you prove that? Um, that's a problem. And that's a specific research question you can develop and work on and use DNA to help you guide you through it. So we often see cases with DNA that are very complex and we're gonna look at one later, but not every problem needs a huge DNA component. Some problems can be solved by looking at just a few matches and it really depends on the quality of those matches, um, what the amounts of shared centimorgans are. Um, so the amount of evidence that you need really depends on a lot of factors. Um, if you're working with a problem like trying to identify your third great grandfather's parents, that is going to involve a lot of smaller matches. So you need a lot more data there because the DNA shared among people who are third and fourth cousins is going to be small. But if you're trying to resolve a problem that is who is my father or who is my biological grandfather, the amount of evidence you need might not be as much because if you have a couple of solid, really good matches, you can probably solve that problem. Um, with just a few DNA matches and other evidence. So when we think about DNA, think about it as evidence, but it also can be used as a clue that leads to information that can identify that next generation. So in many cases, we don't have a hypothesis or a candidate for that next generation, but DNA might lead us to this certain family that I have all these matches that descend from this couple and they were right in that area. I wonder if that could be somehow my third great grandfather's parents. And there's a lot more that goes into it, but DNA can also be used as a clue. And we'll take a look at that momentarily in one of the case studies that I show you. So I like to think of a couple of key methodologies when I think of problem solving and using DNA to help solve problems. And we're gonna go through a number of these. Um, the first that we're gonna go through though is looking at shared matches or in common with matches. So this is a feature that you'll find on any testing site. Um, Ancestry DNA calls it shared matches, for example. 23andMe calls it relatives in common. Um, it's very similar on any site, but basically what you're doing is you're generating a list of DNA matches that you share with another DNA match. So for example, if I go into my test results and I find in my DNA match list, my first cousin, Erin, her mom and my mom are sisters. If I go and look at our match list, we'll have a couple people in common who are very close to us. For example, my mom and her mom and our grandmother are in our match list. But if I go down a little bit farther, I can find other people in our match list. So second cousins, third cousins. So when I'm looking at my shared matches with a first cousin, that's not all that helpful because all it does is really rule out my father's side. So that's me down at the bottom and I'm comparing myself to Erin, whose mom is my mom's sister. So looking at my shared matches with her, all it really tells me is that those people are not related to my dad, they're related to my mom, but they could be on either my grandfather or my grandmother's side. So it's not telling me all that much really other than that their maternal side matches. But if I go and look at my shared matches with a second cousin on that same line, Cheryl. So Cheryl is a second cousin on my maternal line. Um, and you can see how we're related here. So my mom and her mom are first cousins. My grandmother and her grandmother are sisters. So what this tells me, of course, is that this is not my dad's line. We know that. But it also tells me that it's not my grandfather Andrew's line. So I know that any matches I share with Cheryl are going to be on my grandmother's side. And of course, they could be on my grandmother's father, Joseph's side, or my grandmother's mother, Lenore's side. 
So as I'm looking at these matches, second cousins and third cousins, some of them are going to be descendants of Joseph and Lenore. So that doesn't tell me a whole lot, but some of them are going to be people on either Joseph's side or Lenore's side. So looking at this list, Stanley is someone who is on Lenore's side. Uh, Stanley is Lenore's nephew and a first cousin to Sophie and Mary. Um, Jacob is a descendant of Joseph and Lenore. And then Donald is somebody who is also on Lenore's side. He would be, a, I think, a great nephew of Lenore. So what that does is tell me all of these matches that I share with Cheryl, they're not on my dad's side. They're not on my grandfather Andrew's side. They're related to my grandma. And specifically, they could be related to either her mother or her father. So going a little bit deeper and switching to the other side of my family, I can look at a second cousin once removed. So her name is Nancy, and this is how we are related. So Nancy and my dad are second cousins. Nancy's dad, Ted, and my grandfather, Walter, are first cousins. Nancy's grandmother, Mabel, and my great-grandfather, Horace, were brother and sister. So if I look at shared matches with Nancy, all of those people, I certainly know they're not on my mom's side. I certainly know they're not on my grandmother's side, Walter's wife. And I know that they are related to me through Horace because that's how I relate to Nancy. So they could be people who are on Horace's mother or father's side. So these people listed here comprise both. Um, actually, they comprise descendants of Horace and Francis, and then they also comprise people who are in Horace's family and who are in Francis's family. So looking at Nancy, I can narrow down that pool another generation. Now using all of these, you do have to be cautious because you can of course always be related to a DNA match in more than one way. So looking at these, of course, the low hanging fruit with my matches with Nancy is that they are related to me through Horace or Francis. But it is possible that one of those matches appears on my list and appears on Nancy's list for some other reason. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So you want to make sure when you're allocating people to your different sides of your family based on looking at shared matches that you're doing that with care. So I'm going to share a couple of case studies now. Um, one of these is looking at shared matches for a little bit different of a way. So the problem I was trying to solve here is that Margaret Fennessy, my ancestor, she was born about 1830 in Ireland and she came to the US and she died in 1903 in New Jersey. I don't have any records that identify her parents. I do have records related to her two daughters who also came to New Jersey. They were Hannah and Maggie. Um, however, those records have some inconsistencies in them. Um, these are records for Hannah and Maggie's marriages and deaths. And luckily I have a, quite a few of them because they were both married in the Catholic church. So they have church records and civil records. And then they both died um, in New Jersey and New York. So I have death records that name their parents. And among those records, I have three different possible maiden surnames for Margaret, Condon, Carol, and Keating. So my question here that I'm trying to answer are, is who are the parents of Margaret Fennessy? And not 100% knowing what her main name is, so not having a clue at potentially what her father's name was. So a couple of problems here. Um, Margaret's parents probably did not come to the US. Um, she came over in sort of her middle age with her adult daughters. Um, so it's not likely that her parents came with her. Uh, number two, we don't have a location in Ireland for her family. Like many Irish research problems um, prior to a lot of records coming online a few years ago, um, it's not always easy to locate a particular place in Ireland for a family. Um, and another problem here is that Margaret had those two daughters that I told you about, but evidence suggests that she did have other children, but I can't figure out where they are, what happened to them. So my initial plan for using DNA to help solve this problem was 
to find autosomal testing candidates who are descendants of both Hannah and Maggie. So that means getting some descendants of Hannah and some descendants of Maggie. Why do I need both? Because in order to run an in common with or shared matches tool, um, I really need something to compare it against. So I need to run one of Hannah's descendants. So that would be my dad or me, for example, um, against a descendant of Maggie to get a list of people that would be related to either Margaret or her husband, Dennis, who was Hannah and Maggie's father. So I did get that. I did get the autosomal DNA testing candidates, several from each line, Hannah's line and Maggie's line. And then <clears throat> I wanted to hopefully identify um, some common ancestral couples. So I was hoping I got a lot of shared matches um, between Hannah's descendants and Maggie's and that those were people who might have some common ancestors and I could potentially figure out who those people were and maybe they were also a common ancestor of ours um, and potentially related to Maggie's parents. But, um, you know, I was not unfortunately able to do that. There were no uh, shared matches between Hannah's descendants and Maggie's descendants that had common ancestral couples among them. So there were a lot of matches um, none of them seemed to obviously relate to each other in some way that I could pick up on and see how we fit into that puzzle. However, what I did have was three key DNA matches. So what I had here was Judy, William, and Ellen, and these are distant matches. So <clears throat> they are not likely to also be descendants of Dennis and Margaret. And that's what I was looking for was distant matches. So if I found another descendant, of uh, Dennis and Margaret, that would have been great, but it really wasn't what I was looking for. Um, there was no what we call triangulation between any of the DNA matches here, Judy, William, and Ellen, and Anna or Maggie's descendants. And we'll talk more about that shortly. Another problem here is that two out of three of these people never responded to my messages. One did respond, but they were not on the website for genealogy. They only really knew their grandparents' names, and they weren't interested in anything else. So I had to do this research on these three matches independently. Um, I was able to figure out who they were and do some of that on my own. Um, Ellen only had one Irish ancestral line. So of course I'm focusing on the Irish here because that's all that Maggie and, and Hannah and Margaret were, was Irish. So Ellen had one line through a great grandmother. Judy had one line through a grandfather and then William had almost entirely Irish ancestry. So I was able to document their trees and unfortunately I was not able to find a common ancestral couple among them. I wasn't able to find any even common surnames between um, Judy and William and, and um, Ellen. And I, of course, even most importantly, was not able to find any connections to Fennessy and Condon and Carol and Keating names. So I was really coming up empty here. But the one thing I did notice is that those matches all had a common ancestral location. So I wasn't finding triangulation. I wasn't finding common ancestry among them or among them and, and other matches that I found. And I wasn't finding any hints to the surnames that I had as possibilities. But I did have this common location. And so what the DNA here provided me with was some hints to that possible location where my family might be from. So this is somewhat throwing darts a little bit, but the DNA tells me that all of these people I match came from this area. So what it gave me was a place to search. And I knew a little bit about the family that I could recognize them in records. I knew Hannah and Maggie's names uh, and I knew Margaret's name and I knew her husband's name. I didn't know Margaret's maiden name, but I was able to find that there was a Dennis Fennessy who married a Margaret Condon in Clonmel in Tipperary. And so that was really helpful. I knew Condon was a possible name. Um, so that was a great find. Um, I also was able to find baptismal records for Maggie and Hannah um, under the names Margaret and Joanna Elizabeth, as well as several other children. And those other children did seem to remain in Ireland. So that's why I wasn't finding them in New Jersey or nearby. 
Um, and I was able to get additional DNA tests now that I was able to trace Hannah and Maggie's siblings. And um, I was able to get some additional tests just for other projects that I was working on. So that's a little bit different of a use in DNA, um, not you know, what you traditionally see it used for. So next we're gonna talk about um, centimorgans and how to evaluate them in context with other information. So what centimorgans are, are a value that helps predict relationships. So they need to be used in context with other information like location, like where is this family from? And like age as well. So is this person likely a second cousin twice removed or are they you know, possibly the same generation as someone? Is it possible that there's a half relationship in there? And then we also need to consider endogamy and pedigree collapse and how that could impact the numbers as well. So we're gonna look at this chart just briefly to take a look at some centimorgan values. So you'll see me here in pink. Um, my brother is listed there at 2716 centimorgan. So that's what you'd expect of a full sibling. And then you can see my father, Donald, who's listed there at 3,400 centimorgans. So I don't have any DNA tests for my dad's brother, Skip, or for his son, my first cousin, Glenn but I do have a test for Glenn's daughter, Alyssa. So Alyssa would be a first cousin once removed to me. Um, <clears throat> so that relationship um, is typically a little bit more than 204 centimorgans, but that's what she matches me at. So this could potentially be a red flag, but we need to consider it in context with other information. So looking, up a little bit more, there's another first cousin once removed. So Alyssa is my first cousin once removed because she's my first cousin's daughter. Um, however, Janet is my first cousin once removed because she is my father's first cousin. So she's going kind of in the other direction as far as a first cousin once removed. And she's at 484. So the relationship is the same, but the centimorgan value is very different. So do I have enough information here to say, oh, well, something's not right. Maybe, maybe Skip is my dad's half brother instead of my dad's full brother, because that might make more sense. So looking at this chart here, if I look at <clears throat> first cousin once removed, I see an average of 433 centimorgans. So is that what I'm getting for Alyssa? No, but Alyssa's number is within the range. It's 102 to 980, and that's a large range and it is subject to error. But looking at some of these other values, is it possible that Alyssa is a half first cousin once removed at 224, which is over there on the left? That number seems to make more sense. So is there something potentially unexpected in my tree? Um, this is from the uh, DNA Painter site. And on the DNA Painter site, which is in your handout, um, you can also enter the number of centimorgans you share with a match and get information on what possible relationships you could be to that person. So we're gonna type in Alyssa's number, which is 204 centimorgans. Um, and we're gonna see what the possible relationships are. So the most likely are those listed in here that are sort of shaded in gray. So half great, great aunt or uncle. Now Alyssa is 10 years younger than me. Um, so that is not likely. Uh, second cousin, that's possibility. Half first cousin once removed, that's a possibility. First cousin twice removed, probably not as likely. Half great, great niece or nephew. Again, she's 10 years younger than me, so that's not probably it. And then you have also other relationships that are highly likely at 46 and 44%, half second cousin, second cousin once removed, half second cousin twice removed, first cousin three times removed. And then you have other relationships that are much less likely, 6% and 3%. But they are still possibilities. And you'll see that first cousin once removed relationship is in that small 3% category. 204 centimorgans is least likely to be a 
first cousin once removed. But like I said earlier, we need to look at this in context. So if I look at my shared matches with Alyssa and I see, for example, that, so my theory here might be that Skip, my dad's brother is his half brother. And that would make Alyssa my half first cousin once removed, which would work better with the numbers that we're getting. So what that would mean is that Donald, my dad, and Skip only share one parent. So that would be either Walter or his wife. So I would have to look at my shared matches with Alyssa. So I share a lot of matches with Alyssa. I share matches with her on my dad's mother's side and on my dad's father's side. So that doesn't really work with that theory when I'm considering it in context. So you see that match there, Janet, that I told you about. Alyssa matches her as well. And Alyssa also matches Nancy Hicks Wilson and June Johnson and Lou Karnbach, who are all matches on my grandfather Walter's side. Alyssa also has a ton of matches to cousins on my grandmother Walter's wife's side. And she matches all those people as she should. And Alyssa also matches my dad as she should. And she matches other relatives on those and those average numbers. It's just me that she doesn't match as high as she probably should, like a 400 number. So there's nothing wrong with my family tree. Skip is my dad's full brother. Alyssa is Glenn's daughter and Skip's granddaughter. The numbers are just not as high between her and me specifically as they are in most instances. So we have to keep that in mind and make sure we're not jumping to conclusions uh, or, or drawing inaccurate conclusions based on the numbers without considering the context around it. Another <clears throat> strategy that we'll talk about is targeted testing. So while these DNA databases are growing and growing every day, sometimes they just don't include the people that we need test results for. So we may have to ask people to test. So target testing is used for testing hypotheses, trying to figure out how much DNA you share with a person. It's also used for ruling out relationships, figuring out, say, for example, if you share no DNA with a person. And then also for close relationships, it can be used for pinpointing more exact relationships, like half versus full first cousins, for example. So we're gonna look at one case study, and this is a case study for George who was seeking the identity of his biological father. So George's DNA matches were able to be separated into groups based on shared matches. So he has two maternal half brothers and he was able to isolate his paternal group by looking at who did not share DNA with them and looking at those initial close matches. So among those, George has a DNA match to two fairly close matches were called Joe and Lynn. Um, and <clears throat> based on those relationships, George can be placed some way, somehow into their Westcott family line. And he can be placed potentially as a first cousin once removed to Joe. So the way that we can do this is Joe and Lynn are related through Josiah Westcott and Hannah Tyler. So George matches both of them. So it makes sense that George is potentially also related to Josiah Westcott and or Hannah Tyler. And looking at these numbers, he probably is a descendant of them rather than related to just Josiah or just Hannah. So <clears throat> when we are looking at the relationships here, George and Joe share 403 centimorgans of DNA. So we can use tools like DNA Painter and run um, relationship probabilities for those. And one of them, the one that appears most likely based on, again, looking at that number and looking at it in context and looking also at George's shared DNA with Lynn in context, uh, we know that George was born in the 1940s and Joe's mother was born in the 1940s. So it's most likely that perhaps George and Joe's mother might be first cousins and Joe might be a first cousin once removed to George. So this is one of several possibilities, but it's the one that seems to make the most sense given the ages, so that context of the ages, and given the amount of shared DNA between Joe and Lynn. 
So if George is a first cousin to Joe's mom, then that would mean George's unknown father must be a brother to Joe's grandmother. So in this case, Mildred, Joe's grandmother, had two male siblings. So how do we figure out which one is George's father? Um, both of them are deceased, unfortunately, but we can seek out their children for targeted testing. If the children are deceased, we can seek out their grandchildren. And sometimes one sample is good enough if that relative is close enough of a relative, for example, a parent or a sibling or an aunt or uncle, sometimes even a first cousin, depending on the circumstances of the family and the structure of the family. So in that case, we were able to seek a child of one of those male siblings of Mildred. And by testing that child, since Mildred had two full male siblings, by testing that child, that child would have either been a half sibling to George or a first cousin to George. And the amounts of DNA shared between a half sibling and a first cousin are very clear. So that test would have been the only one really needed to figure out which of those brothers of Mildred was George's father. Um, so we are gonna take a look at um, targeted testing a little bit more in the last case study, but I don't want you to think that targeted testing is only one person. Sometimes like in George's case, it was only one person, but targeted testing can also be used for larger projects like this one. So target testing all these people in green, we need a lot more samples for this case because these are not half siblings and first cousins. These people are third cousins, third cousins once removed, fourth cousins, fourth cousins once removed to each other. So one or two DNA tests from a few of these people wouldn't really cut it for trying to solve a problem this far back in time. And more on that in just a few minutes. So triangulation is when three or more DNA matches share one of those overlapping identical segments of DNA that we talked about before. So they share that DNA because they inherited it from a common ancestor. So what triangulation is, is when three people, so person A, person B, and person C, are all DNA matches to each other, and they all share that same exact overlapping segment. What is not triangulation is when, say, person A matches person B, and person B matches person C, but person A doesn't match person C. So there's not three people that match there. There's one person that matches both of those other people. And <clears throat> what is not triangulation is when pe persons A, B, and C share an overlapping segment, because really all that means is that Person B shares DNA with person A on one side and person C on another side, but they just happen to share on that same segment, but it's on the other chromosome. So when we look at triangulation, this is looking at one person's DNA as compared to four other people. So those four other people are in blue, red, teal, and orange, and we are comparing them all to another person. So there's five people involved here. <clears throat> so looking at this, there's no overlapping segments here on chromosomes one, two, or three. So on chromosome three, there are two different places where this person matches one or more of these people. So there's, they match person A on a small red segment, and then they match, I'm sorry, they match the person red, we'll call them, on a small segment at the beginning of chromosome three, and then they match person orange on the very end. But those segments don't overlap. They're not in the same place. But we do have a couple places where they do overlap. So this person matches, person blue and person red on the same segment in chromosome six. So the blue segment is bigger than the red, but there still is a large overlapping piece. You see the same thing on eight. It's a much smaller overlapping piece. So we'd have to consider the size of that segment um, as we do our analysis, but those overlaps are there. So that means that three people, the person whose test this is, the blue and the red, have a triangulated segment on chromosome six. And then the person whose test this is 
and red and teal also have a small overlapping segment on segment eight. So this is what triangulation looks like. So triangulation is rare. Triangulation is much more rare than just having a DNA match with someone. So, and having a shared match with someone. So a sh what a shared match means is that you, person A, match person B, and you both match person C, but not necessarily on the same segment. And that's much more common than matching on the same segment. If, for example, the shared match lists were only based on triangulation, meaning they were only based on segments you shared with your shared DNA match and other people that match that person, if the databases were only based on <clears throat> only based on triangulated segments, then you would have almost, you know, no shared matches listed in your, in your lists. So looking at this, we want to understand that because the database sizes are growing and because shared matching can be used as a tool more reliably now, the use of triangulation, the need for triangulation is more rare. So you don't have to focus only on segments that are triangulated. You can focus on the fact that you match person B and you both match person C, even though that's, that match is not on the same segment. Um, we're also going to look at xDNA quickly um, as another strategy. So what xDNA is, is <clears throat> the specific X chromosome, and the X chromosome has a unique inheritance pattern. So when you share xDNA with someone, you are able to figure out where that xDNA came from a little bit more easily than if you just shared DNA with someone on, say, chromosome 7. So um, everyone has one X chromosome. Women have two, but men have one. But everybody has xDNA. So what xDNA does is when you match someone on your X chromosome, you're able to tell which lines of your family tree you could potentially match that person on because xDNA is only passed down from certain ancestors. So looking at this um, this particular inheritance chart, if we look at this as me, and I have a mystery xDNA match and I'm trying to figure out how I match with them, I can of course look at some of my shared matches and help figure that out. So if I'm able to figure out that I match this person through my mother's mother, but not really anything beyond that, I can say, well, it's not from my mother's mother's father's father's line because I don't get xDNA from them. If you look at the chart, anywhere in white is where you're not getting xDNA from. So if you have xDNA with someone, that's great and it can help you to eliminate where that xDNA potentially came from. But if you don't have xDNA shared with someone, it doesn't necessarily mean anything except for very close relationships. So we're going to go back to Y and mitochondrial DNA in just a minute, but Y and mitochondrial DNA, as we talked about for, before, it's not great for fishing. It can be good for testing theories, but it also can be good for supporting conclusions that you're making using autosomal DNA along with a body of evidence. So potentially if you have Y DNA matches um, and you're not 100% sure, you can't tell whether it's, um, you know, trying to, whether it's proving that your ancestor is one of three brothers, but you have autosomal DNA that proves that, that helps to prove that, you can still use the Y DNA because it proves that you got to the right family initially and you're using autosomal DNA to refine who that ancestor is. Okay, so we are going to conclude with a case study that looks at a number of those different techniques and strategies that we just looked at. Um, and this case study starts with a lot of the documentary evidence, but shows how to weave DNA into a proof argument and use it to prove a conclusion where the documentary evidence is fairly solid, but it falls short of being able to establish proof <clears throat> without kind of bolstering it up by using DNA. So this case study is on the Murphy family. I was trying to figure out who the parents of my 
fourth great grandfather, William Murphy, were. So William was born about 1800 in England, and he died in 1851 in Newark. So a couple of challenges here. Um, William and his wife Mary left a very small footprint in New Jersey. Um, they came over and they, they were not big landowners. They did, were not very wealthy. So they left behind very few records. Um, the death records that they did leave behind do not identify their parents or name a specific birth location in England. What do we know about the couple? They had eight children, Edwin, Mary, Sarah Jane, Martha, Francis, William, Susanna, and Charles. And some of the family at least arrived in the US between when Sarah Jane was born in 1828 and when Martha was born in 1830 in Newark. Um, we do know or fairly certain that William and Mary were born in England. They were not Irish Murphys like most people of that time, and that is fairly consistent among sources related to the family. So what do we know about William? He was a shoemaker. Uh, he and his family were Methodists, which at this time period in Newark in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, um, Methodism was not a very common religion. Uh, but his family had very close ties to the Methodist Church, as evidenced by his children's marriage records and where, their, where William and Mary's funerals were held. Uh, we also have a maiden name for Mary. It's either Owen or Owens, and that's based on New Jersey records for her children, their deaths and marriages. So looking at kind of the friends, neighbors, associates of William, not able to find anything, you know, on his records or his immediate family's records connecting to any family or a place in England, we're going to start to cast a wider net. So looking at the city directory for 1835, William J. Murphy, a shoemaker, was listed at 6 New Street. And another shoemaker, well, Henry Wilson Murphy, was listed at the same address. So Henry has a unique unique middle name, and we are able to follow that unique middle name a bit more. So there's a Henry Wilson Murphy in Newark. He was born about 1802 in England, so he's around the same age as William. He immigrated to Newark around the same time as Williams. He, he has a passenger list from 1832 where he came over with his wife, Jane, and with their sons, Henry and William. And Henry was, of course, also a shoemaker. Uh, he and his family were also Methodists, and he was even employed at the Methodist Church as a sexton. Uh, like William, his parents are not named, or in his birthplace is not named on his death record. And similar to uh, William's wife, Mary, we are able to identify a maiden name of Emery or Emery to, for um, his wife, Jane. So Henry Wilson Murphy has this unique middle name. Uh, there's a Henry Wilson Murphy who was baptized in 1802 in Lambeth, England, which is right outside of London. <coughs> and uh, that Henry was listed as the son of James and Susanna Murphy. So we have a Henry Wilson Murphy here who is married in London to a Jane Emery in 1822. So we have a theory that this Henry Wilson Murphy is the son of a James. So looking at Henry and Jane in England, they had several children born in Reading, which is not too far from London and Lambeth area. Um, and in Reading, Henry was a shoemaker and he lived on a street called Butcher Row. So some of his children, including several who died as infants, were baptized uh, in the Methodist church in Reading. Uh, the two children that we know survived, William and Henry, are the same children that came to the U.S. So we do think we have the right person here, the right Henry Wilson Murphy. Um, so uh, connections to Henry Wilson Murphy, we have William Murphy and Mary Ann Owen, who were married in Newbury in Berkshire, England. Um, their first child, Edwin, who came to the U.S. with them, was born and baptized in a born in, in uh, Berks, Berkshire and baptized in a Methodist church. Uh, there are no baptismal records found at all for Mary and Sarah Jane, who were their other children born in England. So going back to William, William is buried in a large family lot with more than 20 people in it. 
um, at Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Newark. And he's buried there with his wife, Mary, and many descendants. And their graves are marked with simple markers, just like this one you see here that say father and mother and their dates. Um, also buried in that lot is someone named Grandfather who was buried in um, 18 or who, who died in 1841. Now the cemetery doesn't have any records on this person. Their records list what you see here, grave four grandfather. They don't have a name. And it's probably because the cemetery wasn't established until 1844, which is three years after grandfather died. So he was likely removed to that cemetery from another cemetery um, at some point after 1844. But the positioning of the stones and the names on the stones, father, mother, grandfather, suggests that he is either William or Mary's father. Unfortunately, there are no death records in New Jersey until 1848, um, but there are newspaper death notices and obituaries. So <clears throat> there is one for 1841 that identifies an individual of that correct age and searching for the names Murphy or Owen, we found a James Murphy. So James Murphy, who was 81, uh, he died and friends were invited to attend uh, his funeral at his son's house, William, on the Camp Town Road. So this is definitely our James. So we know that William, my ancestor, whose parentage we're seeking, he has a father named James, who is this older man who died at age 81 in Newark and is buried in his family lot. So let's go back to Henry. We have Henry Wilson Murphy. He is in the 1840 census as a head of household and his household includes a male over the age of 80. Could this be James? Also, one thing to note is that the Methodist cemetery where Henry was a sexton had its burials removed to other cemeteries in the 1880s. Um, and the cemetery was, was leveled at that point. There aren't any, any records that exist, but this could potentially help to explain why this James was buried in William's lot and obviously removed there from elsewhere. So we're going to look at a James and Susanna who lived in Reading in Berkshire, England. So remember, Henry's parents, as listed on his uh, baptismal record, were James and Susanna. So <clears throat> James was a shoemaker. Um, he lived on Butcher Row, the same street as Henry and Jane. His wife was Susanna Terrier, who he married in 1797. Uh, Susanna died in 1828, and her father, who lived very close by, also died in 1828. And James can't be found in Reading after 1828. So this is potentially supporting the working theory that I have that James Murphy and Susanna of Reading, who are obviously Henry's parents, is the same James Murphy who was buried in William's lot. James and Susanna also had two other children who were baptized in Berkshire. Um, James was baptized in 1814 and Caroline Jane was baptized in 1818. And they are both well documented as the children of James and Susanna and as a brother to Henry. So they came over to the US in 1831. So around the same time as um, the rest of this family. Um, also on the passenger list with them mysteriously is somebody named Joanna. So <clears throat> uh, no record of Joanna can be found in Berkshire at all. The first record found of her is on this passenger list but she was 22 years old in 1831. So looking at Caroline, who is this Caroline who's on the passenger list and did she come to the U.S.? Did she stay in the U.S.? So we can find a Caroline Scattergood Bannister in Newark um, and she lived in the same dwelling but a different household as Henry in 1850. Um, and she also has connections to William. Uh, William's daughter, Frances, lived down the street from Caroline's son in 1870. And then Caroline's daughter and granddaughter were witnesses to William Murphy's son-in-law's will in 1910. So over time, she has connections to both Henry and William. Um, also, marriage records for Caroline's children do identify her main name as Murphy. 
And then Caroline's death certificate uh, suggests that she came over to the U.S. in 1830, which is not exact to the arrival date, but it's fairly close. Um, and then her age uh, on the death certificate suggests that she was about the same age as the Caroline Jane Murphy, who was baptized in 1818 in Berkshire, and she did use the middle name, initial J. Um, James Murphy, who was on that passenger list and who was a brother to Henry, he did return to England where he married and he had two sons named after his brothers, William and Henry. Um, records that were left behind by him don't name his parents, but they do name his birth year as about 1812 to 1813, which lines up with the passenger list and the baptismal record. And he also uh, consistently identifies his birth location as Reading, and there were no other James Murphys baptized in Reading during that time period. So we're going to get to the DNA aspect in a minute, but first let's look at Joanna. So we were not able to find a marriage or death record for a Joanna Murphy who came to New Jersey or New Jersey area. Uh, this family settled in Newark, so we wanted to focus on that area, but nothing was really found there. So we're at a point where we have this documentary evidence, but is it enough? So is James, who is the father of William, the older man who you know, died in that and is buried in that lot, is that James the same as James, the father of Henry, who can be well-documented in England? Can we make that connection and make Henry and William brother? So looking at the DNA evidence, um, we are going to look at autosomal DNA. Um, William had five children and Henry had four children and many of them have living descendants. The DNA evidence here is going to come from targeted testing. So we're going to find and seek out descendants from independent lines of descent from William and Henry. What does that mean? What it means is that we are going to look at descendants not just from Henry's daughter, Mary, and not just from William's daughter, Char William's uh, daughter, Sarah. We're going to find descendants from all different family lines. So you can see here, Henry, we have a pool of descendants in the first batch that we looked at from uh, his daughter, Mary, his daughter, Lucy, Caroline, and Henry. And then for William, we have descendants from several of his children. So we don't want to get them all just from one child. Um, I also in here tried to focus on descendants that at least had the potential to share xDNA. Um, there were no Y DNA uh, connections able to be made here because unfortunately William does not have any um, biological male line descendants living today. So the DNA evidence, we created it. We created a genetic network by looking at targeted testing and getting DNA matches. So we're not going to focus on triangulation here. We're going to focus on shared matches. And the other thing that we have to look at is making sure there are no connections on other family lines of these DNA test takers. So I want to make sure, for example, that my dad is not related to one of these DNA test takers through, say, my grandmother's German side. And maybe one of these other people has another German line that's not their Murphy line. And that my dad's not related to them that way. <clears throat> and then we need to look at the shared centum organs. So these numbers are very low. They are going to be numbers that are what is expected for the relationships of these individuals who are third cousins, third cousins once and twice removed, and then fourth cousins, fourth cousins once and twice removed. These are the relationships among these individuals. And the shared centum organs are what would be expected for those relationships. So looking at a small pool of candidates from William and a pool of candidates from just one of Henry's daughters here, um, we can see that all of William's descendants in some way, shape or form match some of Henry's descendants. So not every single person matches every single other person, but at the fourth and fourth cousin once removed, twice removed levels, there are chances that you won't match some people and that's just the luck of the draw. But the body of evidence that I have now includes over 60 Murphy descendants. And these are people who all match each other because they all are connected to James and Susanna. 
So <clears throat> looking at this, I have, say, for example, I have all of William's descendants and I can run shared matches between them and say one of Henry's descendants. So of course, the other people who are descendants of William and Henry are going to show up in those shared match lists, but so are other people as well. So who are those other people? Well, remember Joanna that we talked about. So Henry and William's descendants share DNA with a group of people who all descend from a woman named Joanna Murphy Lyon. And she was born in 1809 in England and lived in Pennsylvania. So this person has a profile that suggests that she might be the Joanna on that passenger list. And she does have a link, even though she's living in Pennsylvania, she has a link to Newark. Her husband was from Newark and he was a lion, which is a very common name in Newark, um, Essex County area. So Joanna's family also was Methodist and Joanna, appears to be the woman who arrived in the U.S. in 1831 with James and Caroline. So it's clear to me that she is that woman. What I can't say right now, I think that I don't have enough evidence for, is to say that she is a sister of them. So she could be a cousin. She could be another relative. Um, we don't really know because I don't know much about James Murphy beyond his wife and children. I don't know who his parents, his siblings, things like that were. Um, another bonus here is that I did match uh, without having to seek out DNA from uh, several of James's descendants. So remember, he went back to England and I was able to uh, find some descendants of his that had already taken DNA tests. So some of this tree is starting to come together. My main goal here was to connect William to his parents, and I've been able to do that through um, a couple of siblings, through Henry and Caroline and James, and then I've identified a possible other sibling in Joanna, but I don't know for sure that I can say that quite yet. So looking at the evidence we have here, the documentary evidence shows all these similarities among William and Henry. They were both born in England. They were both Methodists, shoemakers, and they both came to Newark around the same time. We know William was the son of this older James Murphy who died in 1841 and is buried in his family lot. We know Henry is, uh, has identified his his baptismal record identifies his father as a man named James, and we can find that James in England, but not after 1828 to 1830. We know Henry and William can both trace back to the Berkshire area in England, and with the DNA evidence, we can say that shared DNA supports a genetic connection and supports the documentary evidence, which suggests that the two men were brothers. So by looking at this, you know, whole family and doing a lot of these different things with DNA, I can push my theory over into proof by adding DNA to this argument. Um, there's a couple of resources in your um, handout. Uh, these are some books that I recommend for learning a little bit more about genetic genealogy and how to use it to advance your research. Um, and I am happy to take any questions if there are any. All right, great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Again, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A buttons in order to submit them. And as I mentioned before, if you have really specific genealogy or DNA questions related to you and your test results and everything. Um, it may be better suited for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Melissa um, because sometimes it can require a lot of inf background information and other things to, to answer them. So um, we'll jump into our first question. Um, if a male parent is deceased and there are no sons in the family, does that mean that Y DNA information will never be available? Um, no, so you just have to go back a little bit more to find it. So if that's your parent that's deceased, and for example, you don't have any brothers or nephews or anything like that, I would go back, jump to your father's father. Did he have any other sons aside from your father? For example, did your dad have a brother who maybe has a son or grandson still living? If not, think about your dad's dad. Did he have... Um, any go back like another generation and just you know try to try to trace the males downward and you may be looking at a second or third cousin um, at some point or even a fourth cousin um, 
but uh, yeah, it, it, you could definitely find it. And the good thing about Y-DNA is that it changes very little from generation to generation. So you should match those people. There may be a mutation or two uh, along the way, but um, you should be able to, to just trace back a little bit more. Um, can you please define adogamy and pedigree collapse? Sure. So they are essentially the same thing under different premises. Um, but so it's when you have kind of the same ancestors in your tree in multiple spots. So endogamy is when that sort of happens a lot. So endogamy is seen in places where there were tiny communities where people married and intermarried over and over and over again. Um, whereas pedigree collapse is the same, the same concept where you have, you know, people in your tree maybe multiple times, but it's not, not happening over and over and over again necessarily. So what that means in the context of DNA is that, you know, you may share more DNA with someone than would be expected because you have the same ancestor in your tree with them multiple times. Um, can you use ethnicity on 23andMe to determine if shared match is related to a mother's or father's side? Uh, my shared match and I are both multiracial and want to know which side we are related on. Um, so not really. So the to figure out whether they're maternal or paternal slides, you really have to look at shared matches. Um, but sometimes the ethnicity estimates can be helpful for, you know, trying to pick out like, you know, for example, if, if you have DNA matches who um, you can attribute to your mother's side and they are listed as say three different ethnicities, but you know your mother is only one of those, then you can, you know, kind of figure out where that connection is. <coughs> but um, yeah, you really need to use the, the shared matches for that. Are there other questions? Um, is the percentage of shared DNA or percentage of centimorgans ever so low that it is not significant? Um, so that's a good question. It it really depends. There are, you know, some DNA matches that are, you know, you might share seven centimorgans with them. And a lot of the websites don't even really show those anymore. Um, but, you know, some of those, like, for example, I had a, a DNA match who is my third cousin, um, and this is someone I know, someone that I grew up with, and he shared, I think, like 20-something centimorgans with me, but he shares like six centimorgan. He shared like six or something with my brother, and I don't even think we can see that on some sites anymore, so that's like someone that I know that I've spent summers with and things like that. Um, so that person is related to me, but I would not necessarily be able to use that DNA match for much of anything in, um, in uh, like a proof argument or anything. I probably would, you know, look to others. Uh, so th the small matches, in short, you have to be careful with them, um, but it really depends on the project and it depends again on the context. You have a lot of shared matches with that person. You know, a lot of the matches used in the Murphy case are smaller matches, but they are still meaningful. How do you keep track of all your research? I get overwhelmed and can use some tips on how to organize everything. And somebody second that question, especially related to multiple websites of DNA matches. Sure. So um, a, a couple things, like as far as research goes, I try to keep research logs on my documentary research for each family. Um, so that that sort of helps me. And you know, I, I use family tree software, but really only to figure out the who's who of the family. I don't cite sources in it or upload media to it or anything like that. So I, I generally use research logs and I have, you know, my paper files organized uh, now digitally on my computer. 
Um, as far as the DNA, um, I don't use like Genomate Pro or anything like that, that sort of combines all of the tests, all of the matches into one source. Um, I know people who do use that, um, but I do keep a spreadsheet of all my contacts with people on the DNA websites because I find that that is the hardest to keep track of. So anytime somebody contacts me on Ancestry or 23andMe, I put it in a spreadsheet. I have it kind of where I can sort by family. Um, if I can attribute to a family, I can sort by um, by test site. So like I, I include on there, you know, the person's name, the date they contacted me, what family it was, um, what testing site, like they contacted me through or where they are tested. And then just like any notes about the correspondence. And I found that that's been really helpful over the years. Um, because I'll often forget that like, cause I don't use, I use ancestry the most and I'll sometimes forget that like, oh, there's a key match over on 23 and me. And, you know, it's not something I see very often. So I don't know if that, if that helps at all, if not, let me know, I can follow up. Um, is there any help for German matches since it is believed that Germans today aren't allowed to take the DNA testing, though they're not sure if that's still true. Um, so I, I haven't really followed that law over time, but I do know that the consumer DNA tests were banned in Germany at some point in time. I don't know if that's still the case, um, but I, I do know that I, I have a, so my grandmother was half German, so I have quite a bit of um, German ancestry and I do have very, very few matches. The matches that I do have are uh, people who are like me that have German ancestry, but their families came over here. Um, so I, I don't have any specific tips for that, um, other than to hold out hope that maybe something changes in the future. Uh, with endogamy and many, many matches, and almost all matches have the same ethnicity, are some of the sites more useful for details on ethnicity compared to Ancestry? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't use the ethnicity estimates all that much and I, I am not really like the 100% expert on endogamy. There is a chapter on endogamy in the advanced genetic genealogy book, um, but I don't know how the, um, the uh, sites, have kind of evolved over time as far as like ethnicity estimates for those populations that are more endogamous than others. So I would maybe consult one of those sources about that. I'm not 100% sure how to guide you with that answer. How safe is your DNA information in the testing company? Um, so, I, I'm, I'm not a technology like security expert, but there are definitely ways to privatize yourself as far as, um, you know, I don't, I don't know as far as the back end of the testing companies, but as far as what the public sees, you know, you can put your test results under the name Jane Doe or John Doe, if you'd like, you can, I, I've had a couple people who are, um, you know, hesitant to take DNA tests, um, but uh, I can, um, you know, I, I'll tell them to just register a new Gmail address and, uh, you know, just put the test under a different um, name and we can, you know, go forward that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really up to you how much information you want to put out there. I don't see any more questions. Um, so I think we can go ahead and end it there. Um, thank you so much, Melissa, for uh, speaking today on a very complex topic that I'm sure we'll keep, um, keep evolving. Um, this program, again, is being recorded. So a follow-up email will be sent that will include a link to the recording as well as the handout as an attachment. So if you had any issues downloading the handout um, from the chat today, don't worry, you'll have another chance to access it um, via the, the follow-up email. So um, again, thank you, Melissa, and thank you everybody for, for attending today.
Thank you. Thank you so much.